you leave feeling inspired and hopeful. So this event is, is a lot about inspiration, um, which is great. This is our first one without any slides, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, we like to mix it up a little bit. Slides can be great. We'll go back to those next week when uh, we do building soil from the ground up, uh, and that'll feature myself, uh, Juan Alves, uh, and um, Jess Rubin. Jess Rubin works for, uh, she runs Myco Evolve and the Vermont Myco Nodes. She's a mushroom geek. I'm a soil geek, and uh, Juan is also a soil geek with a PhD. So you'll get lots of geekiness next week. Um, so I started the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. We have little brochures on the table. We welcome everyone to join us. It does not cost any money, um, but it may cost some sanity in your email if you choose to sign up for our email list, which is really, really active. Um, if you would like to get the notes from this event and stay connected with the outcomes of this event, please sign up on the list over here on the yellow paper. If you're already on the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition listserv, you will get everything there, so you do not need to do any more than that. Um, I highly recommend that you get the notes. Lauren is here taking really great notes. And uh, so what we do is we're keeping track of events uh, over on the table to this side of the wall. We have a big piece of paper where we want you to list groups that you're a part of that you want people to know about including with contact information. We also want to know about any events that are coming up, and we have three pages of printed out events that we have collected just in the last two events. So there are a lot of really great ways for all of us to be able to connect to existing opportunities in our communities and throughout our state, and that's part of what we want to do at Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition in building the social mycelium to hold our communities together. It is in staying connected and using soil as our model. Um, we have some of these on the table, so take some and tell your friends about it. We're on Facebook. We have a raffle going. If you have not gotten a raffle ticket, please get one. Everyone gets one just for attending. You don't have to give any money. If you give us more than $5, you get extra tickets for every $5 you give us. And you win seven books, potentially. Somebody wins seven books on April 24th. Those seven books are donated by our four women author speakers for this series from Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, and I think that is all, except that I want to say behind me here, we have our sponsors. We have 23 total sponsors, plus the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund, which have made this event possible. Uh, so when you're out in the world, Please thank all of those sponsors. Um, I know right in this room right now, we have Soil for Climate. Carl Tiedemann from Soil for Climate. Soil for Climate is one of our sponsors. And Maddie from NOFA Vermont. Maddie is also one of our sponsors. Um, Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition and my business, Grow More Waste Less, are sponsors just because I've given so much of my time to this event. And Fail also. Um, did I miss anybody in the room representing any of the Upper Valley, Upper Valley Food Co-op <laughs> is another one of our sponsors. Um, so thanks so much. And I want to introduce Maddie Monty from Maddie Kempner. Maddie Kempner from NOFA Vermont. Maddie and I have had the pleasure of working together over the years and I love every opportunity I get. And Catherine Oakes, who is a professor over at VLS. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Oh, I'm going to start. You're going to start with a story. Okay. We've rehearsed all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all, I'm all about story. In fact, um, one of the things that Bill has done in recent years is made a film, which actually in two sessions will do a little... We're going to do a little short segment from, which is a nice little story that relates to the program we're having. Uh, I think it's April 10th. Um, Resilience. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, this, this is a quote from David Corton. 
Some of you may know him, he's a writer. Um, and he says, is it, is it possible that the human future depends upon a new sacred story, a story that gives us reason to care? Could it be a story already embraced by a majority, although it is, has, never inst has neither institutional support nor a place in the public conversation? For people generally, their story of the universe and the human role in the universe is their primary source of intellig intelligibility and value. The deepest crises experienced by any society are those moments of change when the story becomes inadequate for meeting the survival demands of the present situation. We live at such a moment. Humanity's current behavior threatens Earth's capacity to support life and relegate more than a billion people to lives of destitution. This self-destructive behavior and our seeming inability to change have deep roots in the stories by which we understand the nature and the meaning of our existence. The challenge before us is to create a new civilization based on a story of the origin, nature, and purpose of creation that reflects the fullness of our current human knowledge, a story to guide us to mature relationships with one another and the living earth. How is the volume in the room? Beth, are you able to hear? No. I could hear you. I couldn't hear Chris. I want to invite you to come sit here right next to the speaker. And is anybody... Yeah, is, I, I can switch. Okay. Um, is anybody um, having trouble hearing? Or is it, does it sound muffled at all? It does sound muffled, mm -hmm. but... It does sound muffled. If you, if you read the lips as they talk. So <laughs> I think that the key to using this microphone is to hold it about as far as away as I am right here. So you're not right up next to it, but you're like, see how it changes? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't really need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, I'm going to, I'd like to switch it over to Maddie and Catherine. Um, I do want to let you know that we had two other women that were going to join us for tonight's event, and their names are Sha'an Moulier and Cheryl Herrick. And um, Catherine and Maddie and Sha'an and Cheryl and I have had a few meetings. We, we do these Zoom meetings I've been doing with every panel so that we can talk about what we're going to talk about at these <coughs> events. And um, these four women have been amazing. It's been really incredible to work with them. Unfortunately, Sha'an and Cheryl were not able to attend, but they seriously shaped not just this event, but the whole series with our conversations. And they, did, they sent me with an offering that I'm gonna read to you a little bit later. Thanks, Kat. <clears throat> Bear with me while I dial in the microphone. Um, so, can I introduce me a little bit, and I'll just tell you again, my name is Maddie Kempner, and I work for NOFA Vermont, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, um, and my role at NOFA is twofold. I am half-time membership coordinator, um, so trying to get people to join NOFA. I don't know if anybody are, here is a NOFA member. I think probably a few people are, but if you're not, um, please check us out, and I uh, hope you'll consider joining us. Um, and my other role is policy advisor. So I do the, um, a, a large portion of our policy and advocacy work at NOFA. Um, and when Kat invited me to be part of this panel, I was a little unsure because I don't necessarily feel like I'm an expert in the area of storytelling um, or you know stories in general in this context. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we had these calls, 
to plan for tonight um, with this group of women that Kat talked about, I came to realize and sort of was reminded that everyone has a story. And you know, my story and my contribution is as valuable as anyone's. Um, and so I want to start us off with that understanding that I'm no more an expert um, in this area than any of you. Um, and I'm really excited to be here to share what I can and also to listen to everyone else um, who's here tonight. And I'm really excited we're going to have an opportunity to all hear from each other um, about how stories impact our lives and this really important work that we're all um, committing to together. Um, and I also wanted to point out something that Cheryl actually mentioned on one of our calls, which was really, <clears throat> which I've been thinking about ever since, which is that I want to point out um, how, how we listen differently when we're being told a story. Um, when we're preparing to hear a story, we tend to open up, we lean in, um, we settle in. And I don't know if anyone else noticed themselves doing that as Chris started to share um, his quote from David Corden, but I certainly did. Um, found myself sort of turning off the rest of the noise in my brain and uh, settling into my chair a little bit and, you know, putting down my notes. Um, so I think that was a really great way to start us, and thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, I just think that's really um, very telling about the power of stories. Um, so I'll pass it to Catherine next. When also, just so you know, Catherine and I are going to just go back and forth a little bit um, before we open it up to the rest of the room. Thanks, Maddie. Um, yeah, so my name is Catherine Oakes. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Energy and the Environment at Vermont Law School. Um, in that role, I'm uh, coordinating the Healthy Soils uh, Law Project. And as part of that, we're working to uh, identify ways that different members of our communities can work together to, in, to inform uh, policy and create change that helps everybody. Um, as part of that, um, we're interested in learning the stories of farmers and different members of uh, society, government agencies, nonprofits, community members, consumers, um, anybody who has anything to say about our food system and uh, its connection to climate change. Um, so with that introduction, I, Maddie and I are just going to um, bounce back and forth with some themes. And I'll start um, by saying, I guess I, I should say my background is in criminal defense. So in that role, I found storytelling absolutely critical to the pursuit of justice. Um, the problem with facts, which we like to adhere to and which we are so loyal to when we talk about um, certainty and justice and truth. The problem with facts is that they are devoid of perspective. So without, you know, if, if I tell you that, um, you know, the baby cried and then the mother picked up the baby. This is a classic example of two facts strung together. Um, yet we know nothing about the story. Why was the baby crying? You know, why did the mother pick it up? Was the mother angry and that's why she picked the baby up? You know, th these are all, between the facts exists meaning. And that is uh, what stories allow us to access, is that meaning. Um, so in addition to that, stories are not something that exists within each of us individually alone. Stories exist between us. So when I tell a story or when I listen to a story, the story exists between myself and the other person. Okay, so um, if somebody sees the story differently than I do, their interpretation is their own story. Um, so the compiling and contending of narratives and stories together is not only uh, critical to the pursuit of justice as, as I've experienced it um, in the law, but also in the way that we come to decisions as a community. Um, and creating that dialogue uh, 
of stories and combining all of our perspectives together in conversation allows us to identify our shared story um, and in so doing uh, pursue policy that um, is meaningful and, and uh, successful. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that I, um, w what came to mind when Kat invited me to be a part of this tonight um, is how critical I think stories are to making policy change. Um, and, you know, as Catherine said about facts and data, they're important. They're really important and they're really useful, but they only get us so far. Um, and I've experienced this time and again while sitting in um, committee rooms in the legislature advocating on behalf of a particular bill. Um, there are always a number of different people in the room testifying on any given bill. Some people come with uh, a lot of facts and data um, and studies, and I'll give you an example. So recently, several of us in the room actually have been working um, on a bill in the legislature around pesticide use um, and taking really um, pollinator damaging pesticides called neonicotinoids out of the hands of homeowners. And when I was in the committee room testifying and waiting to testify on that bill, uh, there was a huge variety of people in the room, a lot of beekeepers, um, there were environmental advocates, there were farmer advocates like myself, and this one woman, um, Judy, who has been very uh, steadfast um, pollinator defender and comes to you know every committee meeting where they're discussing uh, pesticide regulation, Judy is amazing. She always comes with a literature review of the most recent studies on neonicotinoids and how they impact pollinators negatively. And that is you know, one part of the story or one part of the um, approach that's so critical. And then the other part of the story that I think is really critical um, are the stories of beekeepers who come and share their direct experience with how many hives they've lost in the past year and how they've seen that change over time with the introduction of these more potent chemicals um, and how they feel like these chemicals being used on nearby farms are impacting their, their bees and therefore their livelihood. Um, and so that's just one example and I could, I could give you uh, examples all day of how people's individual stories in the context of something you know, as seemingly um, cut and dry as a piece of legislation really are what I think change the minds of legislators. Um, data informs legislators, and that's also incredibly important. Um, but I think stories are really what change people's minds. Um, and this is true, stories also, Catherine and I were talking about stories also in the context, sounds really boring, but in the context of kind of government and regulation. Um, it's also really critical. We often think of government as this distant, thing that impacts our lives, um, but that doesn't really receive from us um, information about, about how it impacts us. Um, and I thought about this a lot in the context of, I don't know if folks are aware, this is my policy wonk side coming up, but the required agricultural practices um, are a set of rules that were passed that impact a lot of farmers across the state. And the goal of these RAPs, supposedly, is to help clean up our waterways, which of course is something that everyone wants. Um, but for the Agency of Agriculture to write a regulation that can apply across the diversity and appropriately ap apply across the diversity of farm scales and locations and practices in Vermont with this singular goal is frankly, I think, maybe impossible to do really well. Um, so while you know I was participating in that process advocating for rules that made sense for farmers, and somewhat being frustrated by the kind of one-size-fits-all approach that regulation often has to take, I also really sympathize with these regulators who are trying to make these rules without the full context. And so that's where you know people's participation and people's stories as part of that democratic process of making a rule or regulation is so critical. Because without that, these people really don't have the context um, or the full perspective that they need to, to do their work effectively um, and in a way that really benefits all of us. So this is uh, really, we're talking about feedback loops here. So um, feedback loops are the exchange of stories um, 
cyclically, not linearly. So as Maddie mentioned, um, you know, government agencies are made up of people. Yes, they're um, institutions, and perhaps institutions uh, hold power beyond the sum of the individual parts. But regardless, um, you know, the person uh, writing, a, working on developing a rule or um, uh, enforcing regulations um, is, is a human being. Okay, so um, this, this leads into another big point I'd like to make, which is that stor stories can allow us to uh, shorten the distance between us um, and come to understand one another's perspectives um, where, you know, despite the fact that we may have seemingly nothing in common. Um, so this, there's two points here. One is that um, when I can understand, when I can consider the person who may be causing me harm um, or who I, I perceive to be causing me harm or um, somebody who's, you know, a, go a government employee, for example, um, when I perceive them as um, an enemy and just an entity and somebody who um, doesn't care, is incapable of compassion and um, isn't going to listen to me even if I try, um, that, that limits my ability to advo advocate for my cause. Because part of the way that we can get people to care is by um, accessing the stories that those people have that we can relate to, okay? So, um, you know, human beings um, all experience joy, sorrow, pain, grief, loss. <coughs> um, uh, love, you know, relationships. There's a lot of uh, creative space to work uh, to connect those those um, divides. So that's the first point that um, seeing the humanity in another person can enable me to advocate for my cause, the cause of my client, or you know, for the environment. Um, but also, it it enables that person, um, by, not, by not alienating them, they're going to listen, hopefully, <laughs> um, to my story as well. But that, that is far more likely if we can have a conversation um, as though we that have a conversation that acknowledges the humanity um, in both of us. Um, so the next point I, I have been thinking a lot about with storytelling um, is the, is language. So I moments ago said that stories can shorten the distance between us. Likewise, they can create uh, greater divides. And that's because the language that we use in the stories that we tell about ourselves, about other people, and about our land uh, impacts the way that we treat each other and the land. Um, some examples include, um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about human beings, if I refer to people as um, perpetrators, suspects, subjects, assets, uh, threats to be neutralized, um, individuals even, uh, that, that creates a distance between me and that person uh, because it, it, it means that I'm not seeing them as really as human, and it allows me to treat them as such. Um, with the environment, a great example, I think, is um, with mountaintop removal coal mining, uh, the permitting process, um, there's great, there's language uh, that refers to everything above the, the um, resource or the strip of coal um, as the overburden, okay? So we're talking about deeply rich, biodiverse, old hardwood forests with great, um, you know, life above and below the, the ground that we refer to as overburden because it's in the way of the coal. That language, if I am talking to somebody who hasn't seen a mountaintop removal site, and I say overburden, 
that is not going to communicate to them what I'm talking about at all which is good if, if that's the word I want to use because I've allowed them to say, okay, yeah, this is where we're going to move the overburden to so that we can you know, go on with our project. That is the power of language and that is the power of, of stories, okay? Um, conversely, uh, you know, and, and it goes both ways. So um, I love stories and I love storytelling, but I, I will not sit here and tell you that you know, storytelling in and of itself is, is good. It's a, it's, it, it can be good or bad, um, but it's a wonderful tool for uh, realizing democracy and for realizing our shared humanity. Um, yeah, so the, lang the language that we use affects the way that we um, behave. Um, I guess in terms of you know, stories' ability to reduce distance between people. Um, this is something I've been thinking a lot about, sort of again in the context, not just of policy and advocacy, but in the context of this kind of greater work around um, mitigating and reversing climate change and improving soil health, um, and also just Vermont's agricultural landscape and some of the changes and challenges that it's going through right now. Um, there have been a lot of stories told in the media um, that don't necessarily fairly reflect the stories <coughs> of individuals or of groups. Um, and I think, you know, a story that's told firsthand has the ability um, to really meaningfully reflect that person's experience and cut through the noise of a story that's sort of told in the third person um, in the media, for example. Um, and a couple of, you know, one example that comes really clearly to mind are sort of the um, dueling op-eds or stories that I've seen in newspapers locally and nationally recently. Um, you know, there have been op-eds that are um, really demonizing of some of our dairy farmers, for example, um, and kind of calling out dairy farmers as, as polluting our waterways and um, challenging their way of life and their way of farming in this way that um, really removes the person and their personal story um, from the narrative altogether. And that really is an effective way to drive a wedge between people who see themselves as caring about the environment, first and foremost, and farmers. Whereas most people who, um, who interact with or who are farmers know that farmers do deeply care for the, mo the most part, for the vast majority of farmers about the land and the animals that they are stewarding. Um, it's a really meaningful connection to them. Um, so the kind of other side of that coin that I've been seeing a lot lately that I think is also a really powerful story but told from a personal perspective um, are the stories of people losing their dairy farms that have been in their, in their families for generations um, and the struggles that people personally go through trying to maintain this way of life that's really um, financially and economically straining for them and their families while also doing the best they can in most cases to care for those animals in that land. Um, and so it's, there's a really stark contrast in my mind when I read kind of an op-ed from someone who may not have as much direct experience with farmers themselves um, portraying that group from an outside perspective versus the, the inside perspective of farmers themselves who are really living that story day to day um, and can own that. And I think it's, it's really important that we create space in our communities for individuals to tell their own stories um, so that their experience and their true you know, intentions and goals can really be reflected. Because I think at the end of the day, groups that seem like they may not agree on very much, if you project out into the future, especially in the case of Vermont's agricultural landscape and what we all want this state to look like in 50 to 100 years, I think we would have a lot more in common than we would disagree about. Um, and so finding those, those kind of the heart of our um, intentions and what we view as important and valuable um, is a really good way to, to sort of come together in that bigger context and then work toward uh, the future that we really want to see. Um, so in the context of soil, 
Um, I think stories are really critical to bringing together those kinds of groups that we may not think um, can intersect. And I, a clear example of that is that sort of um, farmers versus environmental divide, which in some ways I think is sort of um, a falsehood that there, there is a divide there because I think farmers are oftentimes environmentalists and many environmentalists also may be farmers or homesteaders. Um, and so one of the, the goals that NOFA has this year, and I know that you know, we're not alone in this, um, is hosting on-farm workshops on a few farms around the state who are doing great things in terms of soil health practices and really inviting um, environmental advocates who may see themselves or may have in the past seen themselves as kind of pitted against farmers to actually come to those places and be on the land um, with farmers who are really doing everything they can to innovate in the name of um, climate change and soil health so they can really see for themselves and hear those stories firsthand um, about what farmers are dealing with, what farmers are learning every day about how to steward the land better, um, and then we can all hopefully come to a, a better shared understanding of how um, to respond to the climate emergency that we're all facing together. Yeah, so um, story, stories allow, allow us to uh, have that conversation. Um, and I, I'm just thinking, based on what you said, Maddie, how um, it's, it's so built into the way that we talk in our day-to-day -day lives, um, this notion of separation and this versus that, um, ecologists versus economists, you know, well, what does the economist say about this? Well, what does the environmentalist say? Um, we make us, we assume uh, that different people because of their primary affiliation or their focus that they feel a certain way. And on top of that, we assume that um, that is necessarily in conflict with the way that we or somebody else may feel. Um, so part of um, a healthy and functioning democratic process is um, the presence of all of the different perspectives together. Um, and the, the reason for that is because, uh, you know, we're all members of the same uh, citizenry and um, our society re requires that, uh, justice requires it, that all of our voices are heard. Um, and, you know, when we adhere to just one narrative alone or we, Im worse, impose, um, a false narrative, kind of like what you were saying, Maddie, um, on other people or on places, we've uh, we've done them a grave injustice. Um, so yeah, um, I think I mean this this kind of ties back to uh, the problem with facts alone. You know, data and facts are very important. Um, you know, because they can demonstrate a point. Um, we can see quantified um, evidence that something is causing a problem uh, that, we, that needs to be addressed, for example. However, um, far more powerful than that data is um, what really moves us humans, um, which is the way that we feel. Um, we like another false construct or a, a narrative that we impose upon ourselves and, and there's a term, it is so prevalent that in the law there's a term for it, um, legal fiction. We love to come up with these um, admittedly false narratives because they, they work well um, within, our, within the way that we want the world to work. Um, an example of this is the uh, neutral um, judiciary. So. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, it's taken very seriously. Um, judges are, uh, you know, because they've taken an oath, they are able to strip themselves of their entire past, all of the experiences they've ever had, and sit, you know, stand before you now without any bias. Um, another one is um, a judge can instruct 
him or herself to disregard testimony that was just heard. And I love that one because that is just so patently impossible, it's comical. Um, but we do it and we do it very seriously and we make objections and we talk about it as though you know, the judge just completely forgot what was just said. Um, that is a legal fiction and you know, it's funny, um, but we do the same thing outside the courtroom too. Um, and we impose these narratives on, on one another. I mean, an, another great example that just came to mind um, of a uh, legitimized um, legal construct is the corporation as, as person. Um, you know, that's a, it's a lovely uh, little narrative um, that allows us to um, go about our uh, legal processes with some ease, but it's ridiculous. Um, you know, so uh, this, is, this is the power of storytelling um, as we make decisions and uh, try to convince others to align with our goals and decisions. Um, but so beyond the facts, talking to one another um, by communicating our stories um, requires a certain vulnerability and a certain courage uh, because we, <laughs> and I, you know, another construct that we love is, um, and less so these days, um, which is encouraging, but, uh, you know, expressing emotions is weak and talking about fear is cowardly. Um, you know, it's uh, it's written into um, our laws and, and court procedure even that appeals to emotion are you know manipulative and uh, inflammatory, overly prejudicial. I mean, the law is full of this language. Um, under, understandably, you know, because we recognize the power. Uh, on the one hand, we condemn storytelling as, you know, manipulative and, um, uh, sorry, on the one hand, we condemn storytelling as soft and, un, you know, non-credible and uh, mushy, but on the other hand, we are afraid of it because we realize um, that no amount of data can convince you of something if you feel otherwise. Um, a wonderful example I heard in a class I took the other day is um, a windmill project uh, being developed in New Hampshire and <clears throat> there was some concern before the committee about uh, the negative impact that uh, <clears throat> the win a windmill development project would have on property value. Now there's been some amount of research um, in recent years on this and every single study that's been done has shown that there in where uh, windmills have been developed there has been no negative impact on property value however um, upon presentation of this evidence to the committee um, again human beings uh, they listened to that and they disagreed um, because they you know they thought uh, they felt that property lost value when you put windmills there. Um, you know, so we are very good at telling ourselves stories um, and persuading ourselves um, that there must be something wrong with the data. Um, climate change is a wonderful example of this. Um, as we sit here, you know, our, our federal administration denies the existence of climate change. Um, and I feel a little bit as though, uh, you know, when there's a, a frog, the, the frog in the boiling water, um, it happens so slowly over time that he doesn't even realize what's happening, that he's slowly dying until, um, you know, it's far too late. Um, but so, so uh, this is kind of what's happening to us. Uh, some people call this complacency um, or we just kind of, when shocking events happen, um, we're alarmed and outraged and there's tons of news articles and protests, but then we kind of settle in um, and the narrative shifts and we slowly adjust. Um, so this is why 
um, I think storytelling in this context, I think this is a wonderful event, Kat, um, because it, it, it is very important that we um, continue to tell our stories and continue to talk about um, these, uh, the feelings that we have beyond the facts, because um, that is what moves people to change, whether you know, we like it or not, and whether that fits into our understanding of the way humans operate, um, you know, people people are moved um, to action. They're not con they're not convinced to do so because the data says they should. Um, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious about all of you. While Maddie's looking something up, I want to know who here is a writer? And that means you like to write, not that you're published. Okay, great. Um, who here writes songs? Songs? Mm -hmm. Who here tells story through imagery and art? Tells stories to who? Imagery and art. Oh, who? I see. Yeah. How about theater or dance or movement? Who here is a gardener? Who here is infatuated with the story of the forest? or the world of mushrooms. Um, what else can I ask you that I'm curious about? Who here works in the field of law? Who works with municipalities, hospitals, schools? These are all places where I feel like story is incredibly powerful. I don't think there's a single place where it isn't. But while you were talking, those were some of the places that really stood out to me where I see the need for story to become more of what we do. And um, the other side of story that, that you're both encouraging us to do is listening. Um, and listening with presence. And to me, listening with presence means that I have, I'm constantly trying to do this, I'm human too, but trying to stop my thoughts and my reactions from what I'm hearing and just listen. So listening with presence is really, really listening. And I found that the more that I train myself to do that, I am finding different outcomes from all of my relationships, whether it's my doctor or the insurance company or the folks from India on the phone for consolidated communications. <laughs> right? Storytelling is really important. I just thought of this while, um, thank you, Kat. Um, I just thought of this while Catherine was talking, and, and Kat mentioned this earlier, just in the passing conversation we were having around stories and um, how they are so often used in you know, advertising, for example, to, to call us to a certain action, to get us to buy a product. Um, we use stories in the context of NOFA as a membership organization to try to get people to join. Um, we have been you know, collecting origin stories, for example, from our board members about how they first got involved with NOFA so that we can use those to share with others and hopefully inspire people to get involved with us as well. Um, and in terms of climate change, I think the way that we use stories is really important and interesting and complicated um, because they're so often, the narrative around climate change is very often, and this is one of the things Kat mentioned earlier, one of fear. Um, and fear, you know, oftentimes stalls people, um, whereas, you know, hope can inspire people to act. But on the flip side, I also saw this amazing um, quote from Greta Thunberg, who's a, a Swedish teenager who's kind of come to the forefront of the climate uh, resistance movement and climate change resistance movement and 
uh, was recently nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, you may have heard, which is very cool. Um, and this quote I saw from her really struck me the other day. Um, she said, adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act. I want you to act as if your house is on fire, because it is. Um, and that's, I think, one of few messages of fear that actually really made me want to act. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've got, I, I would say go another five minutes or so, and then I'll, I'll read this bit, and then I'd love to, does that sound okay, Chris? Um, yeah, so just a couple of closing um, points, which I've already touched on, um, are this, uh, the, the real need that we have for uh, functional and whole feedback loops. Um, and by this I mean, you know, the sharing of stories uh, amongst, um, you know, from farmers to uh, government agencies, but also conversely, you know, government agencies to farmers. Um, there's a wonderful um, predicament of a state employee who um, goes to, uh, you know, an area with a map and he's looking for, um, he, he's, he's talking to a landowner um, about uh, something going on on the land and the landowner is looking at his map and he says, um, Oh, there's a stream here. Um, you know this. Uh, the you know that that easement can't go through right there. There's a there's a stream, and the state employee looks at his map and he says, "No, there's no stream here." <laughs> and the man takes him out to um, you know his his land and he shows him the stream. And um, the state employee is frozen because there is no stream on that map, um, and he can't function because of it. And this is so amazing because. That in and of itself is an interesting, um, you know, malfunction of our feedback loops. But beyond that, the landowner cannot just tell the government agency to please put his stream on the map, um, you know, because it doesn't fit within the process. Um, so that is th that is a, a poorly functioning, if at all, feedback loop. Um, so, and I, I do kind of wish I brought this one slide, but I can describe it to you. Um, here, here is a, an ex a description of a uh, feedback loop that is hardly a feedback loop at all. Um, if there's a development project or any, any kind of um, action uh, being discussed, um, typically it starts with industry and science. Um, industry funds the science. And then um, the design phase rolls out. Um, after that, you know, the government gets involved and there's discussions about um, procedure and process, um, at which point science may again come into this uh, um, conversation, this time funded by the government. Um, after that, there's a period, you know, 60, 90 days, what have you, um, for public input uh, before policy is implemented and regulations, uh, you know, developed. That, um, at that point, you know, the, it's, the development has already um, happened. And so asking for public input at that point is a very common way that we, um, you know, include our communities in our process, um, but, you know, I think, I think the, point, the point is clear. Um, true democracy requires that we have um, all of our perspectives included at the very beginning. Um, so, you know, I'll wrap up by saying, uh, human beings love stories. You know, we love to watch movies and we love to listen to stories. And when we're children, our parents tell us stories, um, you know, of the old days and we're just totally, ca our, our imaginations are captivated by, um, you know, worlds that, that we don't know and that we can just imagine and, uh, you know, stories make us feel things, they make us feel connected, um, and they move us. Um, and
And, you know, realizing that allows us to really communicate with one another in a, uh, in a way that recognizes uh, the humanity in ourselves and with other people and connects us in a way that limits my, you know, it decreases my ability to um, inflict harm on somebody that I now know through, through the stories that we've shared um, because, you know, we, we protect what we love and we love what we know. Um, so I think storytelling is this really wonderful, universal, um, as old as time practice uh, that we can use and that we really need to use to connect um, research, government, science, communities, farmers um, in uh, really developing um, you know, a system that, that uh, allows us to uh, combat climate change, uh, not at the expense of any of our uh, community members. I've had this um, scene running through my head almost this whole time, um, just in the background. I don't know if, raise your hand if you've seen the movie The Life Aquatic. It's very, the Life Aquatic. The Life Aquatic. It's an amazing, quirky, very strange uh, Wes Anderson movie. Highly recommend it. Um, it stars Bill Murray and Angelica Houston. I was watching it recently, and there's this amazing scene where, um, so Bill Murray's character is this aquatic explorer, his name is Steve Zissou, and he takes his crew on these underwater explorations, um, and they see amazing things, and he makes all these documentary films about the ocean, and um, has discovered all these creatures. He's sort of like a Jacques Cousteau character um, in the movie, and very quirky. And <laughs> or his next documentary, they've um, acquired funding from this bond company who's going to fund it, their next um, exploration. But because they have some doubts about you know, the Zisu squad's um, ability to, to carry this out um, and their intentions, they send along this guy who they call the bond company stooge um, to keep track of them, make sure that they're you know, on the up and up and that they're not you know, spending money frivolously. Um, and so the intermediary tells Steve Zissou, you know, they're going to fund you, but they're going to send along this bond company stooge. And so they get in the elevator after this meeting, and Steve Zissou, the, the explorer, is in the elevator with, you know, one of his, his team members and the bond company stooge, and he says some, some off-putting thing about, oh, well, you know, you're just the bond company stooge. And the bond company stooge looks at Steve Zissou and says, I'm also a human being. <laughs> And, you know, then Steve gives him a hug, he learns his name, and he's kind of, like, a little bit more part of the team for the rest of the movie. Um, and it's just this, like, very touching moment because you all sort of, in watching the movie, you know, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, the Bond Company stooge. That guy seems, you know, that guy seems boring. Um, and he, you know, points out that he's a human being, and I just, it's so touching, and it just um, is a nice reminder that we're all human beings and we all have a story to tell. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Kat, for having us, and I'm excited to hear from the rest of you. Yeah, let's hear it for these two. Um, these two women, uh, and, and the other two who I'm going to read from now, um, inspire me so much. Um, so this is a piece, uh, and it's just called Offering for Soil Stories event. This is from Sean Moliere and Cheryl Herrick. Sean Moliere and Cheryl Herrick wanted to be able to take part tonight and are grateful to Kat for the opportunity and sorry they were each unable to make it happen. But the topic of how the health of soil of the earth is connected to stories and to storytelling is a beautiful and fertile one that excites us both. When we talked about it, we thought about how the words human, humus, soil, not, not the chickpea hummus, um, and humility share a root word. Human, humus, humility. And that let us think and wonder about how the act of listening with humility of being present to complexity and mystery, whether in the soil or in, in each other's lives, 
seems like it's got to be a key practice in healing and growing the world. That part about humility seems so important with story. How we might accept an invitation to bear witness to another's truth without assuming that we can never know a complete truth. And how this maybe applies to soil health when we think about farming practices and how families and communities are seeking to live whole lives in balance with each other and the land. And in the complex landscapes of history and power and privilege and the desire for wholeness. We are living in such interesting and complicated times of awakening and striving. And on some level, it seems like the goals of a just society for human beings and a society in balance with the more than human world are facets of the same gem. And maybe presence and humility are a key part of both. Thank you for the opportunity to share a bit of our thinking and our process. If you're curious about our work together on the Who Farms project, or Sha'an's work with the I Am Too Vermont project, um, or Cheryl's work in the communications at the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, who is another one of our sponsors for this event, um, feel free to get in touch. And I will make sure that their contact info uh, and the projects that they're working on I am to Vermont, or I am Vermont to, and Who Farms Project in Vermont, um, that you get links to those. Um, I also, in the notes, will make sure to send around some links that I've found recently to some really beautiful um, videos of farms in Vermont. Uh, some are put out by farm.gov, I think, um, and these are short little stories. Have you seen these? Yeah. They're really amazing um, uh, of Vermont farmers that are really doing a lot of good work for land stewardship and um, struggle with uh, trying to pay the bills and also struggle with the public perception that somehow they're not stewards of the land even though they have been for so many generations. Um, and it's a really beautiful story. There's also another series of beautiful videos about farms on the Real Organic Project website where they have been um, taking video. Any farmer who signs up to be a Real Organic Project farm, which is uh, certified at a higher level than, well, it's, yeah, we have to be careful what we say there. Um, they're Real Organic. Um, so, uh, in order to get that certification, you, you get videoed. And so you get a virtual farm tour of each one of these farms. You meet the farmers and you get to see their landscape. And I think it's a really beautiful way for us to try and connect with our food in a marketplace that's becoming more and more and more confusing. Um, so, I, I would like to pass the mic around. Um, and what I'd like is, I, I would like to know who you are. I think we all need to know each other so that we can continue to build the resilient community that I know we, we can do. Um, one of the things I love about passing the mic is that we get to find out the incredible people in the room and all of our talents and skills. Um, we have a lot here. We're, we live in a lucky place, I think probably most people are lucky, and there are great people all around them, wherever they are. Um, so say who you are, what brought you here, and then um, I'd like you to either ask a question that may not get answered, because that's really fun to do, um, or just say a statement. And we have enough time. We may be able to go around twice. And I'm going to ask you to not, don't hog the mic, because there are a lot of us here, so we want to try and pass it around. But also, please take some time to say what you want, and please hold the mic like that, you know, okay? Um, we'll let you know if we can't hear you. Um, and when we get to Carl Tiedemann, I would like you to take extra time to please read us a poem that we've discussed. Beth, would you like to go first? 
Hi. Okay. I can tell the difference just in my own ears. Yeah. My name is Beth Champagne. I live in St. Johnsbury. It's 20 years since I moved away from Randolph, and I've been down here 25 years. So I'm really, really happy. That's one reason I come, because it's in Randolph. But the biggest reason I come is that once I discovered this Vermont Healthy Soil Coalition, I knew those were the people I needed to be with. I had a couple of really difficult points in my life found that only when spring came and I could get my hands in that soil was I confident that I was still me. Yeah. I've always gardened from when I was a kid, but even before I was big enough to garden, I was being brought up by a father that I thought must be a French peasant. I mean, hey, our name is Champagne. No, sort of. It's what they call Métis in Canada. You're European and Native American. It was my grandfather who was not French at all. Um, Meme was French. So once I got done doing the college thing and I'd, e I'd even adjusted to being in the city, it didn't really take long before I said, this will not do, and I came to Vermont. Um, I just wish that all of our schools in the state could stop everything and have a whole year in which kids basically just learned the soil health principles and all about the extraordinary power of getting to know that the earth Alive and we're part of it, just like she said, human and humus. Because there's so much we can do loving the land and caring for the plants and trees and receiving gifts, even um, so these people tell me, I haven't gone out personally to prove it, but you know how nice it is to walk in the woods in the summer. It's mo moister and cooler. There's just so, so much that we can receive. And the biggest thing of all to me would be, I mean, as a grandmother, if we don't give young people the chance to get out there in the sunshine, in the dirt, doing work that helps us all even by this one cooling effect I mentioned, never mind all the carbon coming back in the soil where it does so much powerful work. If we don't give them that, what kind of adults are we? That's my question. Hello. Hi, my name is Karina Makiash. I am a master's student at Vermont Law School studying environmental law and policy. Um, I'm from Southern California and have been interested in agriculture and have worked on farms probably for the past five years in California and was drawn to come to Vermont because of its own rich agricultural history and story. Um, and I feel very special to be here to learn the stories of all of you. And yeah, thank you. My name is Stuart Saunders Smith. I'm here because my wife invited me. She is uh, very involved with agricultural issues. Stories <clears throat> are literally genetically uh, imp implanted, if you will. <clears throat> uh, stories have a, a beginning, middle, and end, as we all do. And um, Telling stories is the fundamental, is a fundamental way for all cultures to impart values. The structure of a story um, is impartial to the contents of a story. So it's very important to um, 
fill those contents with light. Hi, I'm Sylvia Smith from South Stratford. Is this in a good spot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to grow more and more of my own food and uh, build a, uh, I don't know what to call it, build a place that is um, resilient and friendly to plants and animals and people. I have a little story about trees. I used to live in Baltimore, Maryland. And Baltimore is a very large uh, city. There are, there's a lot of poverty. There are many areas of the city where you can go for blocks and not see a single plant. No trees, no grass coming up out of the sidewalk, no plants of any kind. Um, these areas are hard to live in. Um, lots of crime. And someone had the bright idea, well, why don't we plant trees? So they planted trees uh, along the sidewalks, and the crime rate went way down. Nothing else changed except the presence of trees in the neighborhood. So I take this to mean that trees and, and plants do much more for us than just you know, things that you can list. There, there is some other thing that we need. We need to be involved with trees especially. Hello everyone, my name is Jack Spicer. Um, I'm an attorney in Woodstock. I'm originally from central Ohio, where there's a different kind of agriculture. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I'm originally from central Ohio, where there's, there's really a different kind of agriculture um, than you see out here. Uh, a lot of flatter land with uh, lots of row crops. So when I moved out here for law school, I really fell in love with this area, uh, in particular just because of the people and the stories here, but also just because of the agricultural practices. Um, it just kind of astounded me that there are so many CSAs, which is something I hadn't even heard of um, back in Ohio. But uh, I, I learned about this series because I was recently appointed to the Community Resilience Organization of Hartford, um, which is a, a recent sponsor of this series. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, this, this sounds, like a, sounds like a good one to go to. So, so I picked this particular talk. Hi, I'm Genevieve Byrne. I'm also part of the Vermont Law School contingent here. I work with Catherine in the Energy Institute where I'm a staff attorney uh, working with clinical students on particularly renewable energy projects, but our focus is also on the impact of those projects on agriculture and farmland and getting um, agricultural participants to be able to participate as well in kind of the renewable energy revolution. Um, I have a, maybe three short, very short stories. Uh, the first is what brought me into my interest in agriculture and community building, uh, which is when I was living in Northampton, Massachusetts, I was sort of looking around for things to do and the organization Grow Food Northampton had just uh, organized itself to purchase the single largest contiguous parcel of land that was left over in downtown that was about to be sold off for development. And this group of community members organized within six months and raised 
$100,000 in that time to then purchase that piece of property, start a nonprofit, and lease that property out to local farmers and create a community farm. And the very, I, I did some canvassing for them, and the very first door I knocked on for fundraising wrote me a $1,000 check to support this project, which gave me a fairy tale story of how easy it might be to raise money for <laughs> community-based agriculture. But what a fairy tale that was, because they're still thriving today with a, with a community farm right in downtown. Um, the second is uh, about the word NIMBY, or not in my backyard, which I think is, in, in a lot of ways, a derogatory word that we use for people that want to participate in the public process that Catherine mentioned when we have development projects and we allow, open it up for public comment. When people, in fact, exercise their right to comment, they are often <coughs> called NIMBYs or people that do not want that in their backyard. I think that is a story that we tell to undermine very valid concerns of people that want to comment on development projects, even good renewable energy projects. And so I'm trying to remove that word from sort of the community vocabulary. Hmm. I think the other story that we tell, though, and that is sometimes told by, by <coughs> these NIMBYs, is that renewable energy is ugly or has an impact on aesthetics or has an impact on tourism. Um, these are stories that we tell. We, we just as we uh, decide standards of beauty in all, all kinds of realms, we decide that windmills or solar panels are somehow objectionable because of the way that they look. And that is another story that I would like to sort of remove from our vocabulary. I think that uh, renewable energy and working to mitigate climate change is a beautiful thing and something I'd like to be supported as such. My name is Nicole Conti, and I live in Barnard, Vermont. I've been there for a little over 20 years, and uh, uh, my, I guess my professional hat is environmental educator, went to Antioch a, a long time ago uh, for a master's in environmental studies with the education focus. And I do a lot of out of school time stuff with kids. Um, and I'm here because I think the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, Kat, I've heard her speak a few times now and she, her passion really impresses me. So I, I just like to be where she is. <laughs> and um, it's good to get re-energized in an area that I care about. And also an area that I feel really a, very much a beginner at, like understanding <coughs> the soil. Even though I have this environmental studies degree, I just, there's so much to know and we're learning all the time. And I, a mom of a teenager, so my focus really hasn't been on, on continuing my education in a lot of these areas. So this is neat to be here. And also Gail too, I've been really impressed with Gail's work. So that's, those are two organizations that I've gotten on their listservs in the last few years. Um, also the theme of stories really is interesting to me and I just thank you for your sharing and reminding me. Um, Cause I took a storytelling class at Antioch and I, I think I, I have tried to think about storytelling in education, and I haven't used it extensively in any kind of, um, I, I mean, I'm sure I use it informally, but I have tried to use it more formally. It's not always easy to figure out the best way to incorporate story and storytelling in education. So I guess that's my question for myself, is how I can do more of that at um, my summer camps and things like that. I mean, you sit, you sit around and you talk, or at, at sleepaway camps, there's more storytelling because you have more time. And I work with really little kids, and they love to tell stories. 
um, and just chat, right? How can UBI sometimes bring, uh, ask the right questions or uh, get them to ask the right questions to get everybody learning more together? Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm Lexi Basil. I'm a Master of Food and Agriculture uh, Law and Policy at Vermont Law School. Um, I also volunteer with uh, Vital Communities Food and Farm uh, team right by the Upper Valley Co-op. Um, and my interest is uh, mainly in uh, food justice and environmental justice, um, especially the intersectionality with race. Um, and just a little anecdote. Um, so my grandfather uh, is a, was, was a second generation Italian. Uh, I'm from, Hart, from West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and he just passed away. He was 93 years old. And um, I think the thing that he was most proud of me for was last summer when I called him and told him that I was working on a farm. Um, <laughs> he, was the, he was just over the moon about it, about getting my hands dirty and um, so, and it ended up being one of the most important experiences I've uh, ever had, so. My name is Nancy Rice, and I live in Randolph Center. And um, I got to get an agricultural background without paying money, because I grew up on a farm <laughs> from day one. And um, I've been really grateful to have that background. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, I have a friend who came, I think, last week to this program, which I wasn't at, and she's a farmer, and she said, I don't think she mentioned this because she's kind of um, shy, but she said, they're talking about all the farmers making pollution into Lake Champlain, but what about all those homeowners that use poison on their lawns and so forth? And I thought, yeah, <laughs> do they think about that? I remember going into the hardware store 20 years ago and there was a, oh, this thing was a 24D mm -hmm. in regular lawn thing. I was appalled. The other thing I'll just mention is you mentioned uh, the uh, screen that wasn't on the map. Well, a few years ago, about eight years ago, our daughter and her family moved to um, Eastern Mass. And um, so usually I like to try to orient, orient myself. Where's north and south and so forth? Where's the sun come up and go down? But behind her house was this body of water. So I looked on the map and it wasn't there. Neither was the one a, a little further up. And I thought, huh, what's the matter with this map? <laughs> well, I think it was a man-made pond probably. Because then I could be thinking, we used to go down to visit um, my in-laws in southern Vermont for about 40 years, and we'd go six times a year. And we'd pass this, this body of water, and a couple times we stopped and had a picnic there. And then a few years ago I thought, I noticed, it's not there anymore. And so it had all filled in, I forget that term, but there's a word for how that natural progression works with ponds. So I could relate to your story of no map there, but the map is just a man-made thing. So. Hi, my name is Travis. Um, I'm originally from Minnesota. I've been out here in Vermont for the last three, a couple years studying soil ecology. Um, I'm here because I'm trying to become a better soil storyteller myself. Um, one of my goals is I'm going back to uh, North Dakota to study commercial agriculture to help I want to learn how to implement regenerative techniques to meet the demands of commercial agriculture in the Midwest. Um, so yeah. yeah, one of the questions I guess I would have is these conversations are really inspiring, but are they happening fast enough to meet, to uh, get us in the mass and to really make a change with these large systems that we're having? My name is Dean Wallenberg. Uh, I'm from Rhode Island. 
I, uh, I've lived in Vermont for only two years now, and uh, I actually didn't even know this was a, the storytelling at, uh, part of this class when I got here, which is kind of cool because I moved to Vermont to work with a group called uh, the Valhalla Movement out of uh, Montreal, and they kind of, their whole thing is they are environmental storytellers. They're kind of trying to make, uh, you know, sustainability cool. They're like big in the social media world and all that. And um, and then I also, uh, one of my, my own projects is a group of friends and I, we kind of wanted to bring like the, just the ideas of like of art. And you know, there's a lot of like struggling artists out there who who really are, who like, want to change and, and help, um, you know, tell, tell their story, but also tell their story in a way that helps the world uh, ecologically as well. And I think there's kind of like a, it's a hard, it's hard for them to physically do. So I, I, so me and my friends created a group that's kind of trying to bridge that gap called the Wicked Collective. And um, so I guess my question for everybody here would be, uh, how can we empower uh, folks with less means in, uh, to be able to participate in the change that they want to see in the world? I'm Laurel from um, Portland. Um, I'm <coughs> the first of refugees uh, from Long Island, uh, a petroleum refugee. I expect there'll be climate refugees following me. Um, and I'm wondering how many people have heard of Jem Bendel or have read anything uh, not very many. Okay, well, there's a concept uh, he has of something called deep uh, adaptation um, with the assumption that we are not going to preserve our economic system and that climate collapse could happen uh, within the next five years. And it's much easier for me to accept that and actually welcome it because I have had to give up petroleum in my life. I uh, had to give up my house, my clothing, my books, my computer, my livelihood. Fled Long Island, came to Vermont, and I've never been happier in my life living on very little money. And in the interest of time, I'd probably better pass the mic here. <laughs> My name's Greg. Um, I kind of lucked into this series tonight. Uh, I've been trying to come several of the previous series and uh, had missed them. But I'm a, I was raised in Vermont and uh, I left the state after finishing uh, my college <coughs> at UVM and uh, was in Colorado for 20 years. And uh, storytelling has always been a big thing in my experience. I grew up around a lot of farms um, and uh, worked with a lot of people on those farms at various times. And, uh, this little uh, program tonight uh, ties together a lot of things for me, um, not the least of which is the messaging of, of uh, our leaders tonight because the when I went to Colorado, uh, I was very much involved in messaging and storytelling around environmental activism and leadership training and stuff like that, <clears throat> which is what I was doing with young people out there uh, for a couple of years. And it's exactly how that message can get corrupted and manipulated and adjusted over time that uh, can make it pretty messy. Uh, and hard to stay to the, to the core message and the true message of the story. Um, and to make sure that the disinformation that's out there does not um, overwhelm you. Uh, my family and I uh, just recently moved back here, and um, I've only been back in the state for a little less than three months. So uh, this is just kind of a, been a really exciting thing to be a part of tonight to see how this all uh, is going on here. Um, we had talked for years about leaving Colorado to come back. Uh, couldn't find the circumstances that would work for that, and so, um, but we really felt like. We could no longer live in the state that was plowing all of its dirt and its soil under uh, to build massive tracks and development throughout. And uh, while 
everything was burning, so uh, we were ready to um, come back here to the place that I grew up in and called home. So it's good to be back. Um, I'm going to try to project. Can people hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'd like to, well, first of all, start with a shameless plug for my organization, Soil for Climate. Uh, if people are interested in following this topic at a global scale, uh, we have over 10,000 members from more than 100 countries. Anytime new studies, reports, um, anecdotes from uh, people's farms um, come out, they're shared globally, and anyway, it's an exciting community. Um, I'd like to actually say, first of all, I'm, I am a, a poet, a climate and a soil poet, um, but I'm not reciting any of my poems tonight. I hope uh, there'll be other opportunities for that. Um, but I would like to start with a, a brief excerpt of a poem, um, a point that Catherine made in her comments about uh, facts being devoid of perspective. Uh, this is a theme that was addressed by the American poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, who was uh, quite well known about 100 years ago. Typically, she would perform to sold out audiences, and sometimes audience members would be so carried away by her passion that they would literally have to be carried away on stretchers. Um, this is from her poem, Huntsman, Wet Quarry, 1928, Edna St. Vincent, I'm sorry, 1939, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who wrote, Upon this gifted age, in its dark hours, rains from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. Um, a few days ago, I was listening uh, to Krista Tippett's show on public radio uh, called On Being and she was interviewing a poet named Sharon Olds. And I was quite taken by this poem, Ode to Dirt by Sharon Olds. Dear Dirt, I am sorry I slighted you. I thought that you were only the background for the leading characters, the plants and animals and human animals. It's as if I had loved only the stars and not the sky which gave them space in which to shine. Subtle, various, sensitive, you are the skin of our terrain. You're our democracy. When I understood I had never honored you as a living equal, I was ashamed of myself. As if I had not recognized a character who looked so different from me but now I can see us all made of the same basic materials, cousins of that first exploding from nothing in our intricate equation together. Oh, dirt, help us find ways to serve your life, you who have brought us forth and fed us, and who at the end will take us in and rotate with us and wobble and orbit. Um, I just want to acknowledge that it is 8.30, which is the time we said we'd end. I'm not ready to go. I'd love to hear from the rest of you, but I just wanted to acknowledge it's that time. If you, if you need to get up and go, please do. If you can stay, please do. Yeah, let us. Hi, my name is Abby Miling, and I live in Randolph Center. Um, this Central Vermont has been my home for almost 40 years, um, but I too came from the Midwest, like a number of you, and they used to say, um, I'm from Wisconsin, and, and the people from Vermont, I remember going to the Woodstock, um, the Rockefeller place, <laughs> now I'm forgetting <laughs> what the name is, but anyway, and hearing the story about how, thank you very much, Billings Farm. Um, and hearing how the people in the Midwest, you know, they were the people who used to live here and just need a little more elbow room out in the fields. And uh, anyway, there's a connection always. So I'm also um, part of Bale, and I'm on the Bale board, and, and I was drawn to Bale um, when we were having those farmer dinners back at in the South Royalton High School, or the elementary high school, cafeteria and, and just have always been kind of drawn to any event that related to farming and, and food and, and it's been a rich existence in my life. Um, 
my, all my life. And I think the only times, not the only times, but most of the time when I feel most alive, of course, I'm, my hands are in the dirt or I'm out in the woods and being. And yet, when I started gardening, I had no idea what the soil really had in it other than simple things like worms and such. And now it's like I'm just captivated with what it has to give for me and all of us. Anyway, and I'm also a cat fan now. And this is very good, cat. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and I'm not going to say much more because I know it's time. But I, I think that what I'm picking up tonight and I'm learning f and appreciating most is you know, that listening quality, because um, I want to be able to listen more to people who I'm different from um, and who think differently from me and, and opening that avenue, because I, I need to hear that story. And I, I liked the concept very much of inviting the differences to come out before policy gets made, before, that strikes me as very powerful, and I just want to remember that. So, thank you. Hi, I'm coming a little closer and join the group. I'm David, a uh, longtime resident here in Randolph. And uh, I was late for uh, tonight's gathering for, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, I was providing care for my 18 month old granddaughter. And second, uh, when I thought I actually was on my way to get here, uh, I got stopped completely in my tracks by watching the rising of the super mm. full spring moon mm. over Randolph Center this <laughs> evening. <laughs> my goodness. Um, so the word for my story today is, is newness. Um, seeing the world through the newness of a child's beginner's mind. Uh, we spent time this afternoon, a sunny afternoon, out on the porch uh, playing with seeds. Uh, and Kaya was enthralled with just letting, picking up seeds and letting them run through her fingers and, and moving them from container to container. Um, I think she could have spent most of the afternoon doing that, but then it got to be time for lunch. Uh, <laughs> later in the day as we were out, um, sighed again, uh, she stooped down and, and picked up uh, an, an open pine cone uh, that was finally getting revealed as, as the snow pulled away. Um, and she held that um, um, all the way home. And as we went up um, the steps to, to, to her house, to my, to my daughter's house, um, lo and behold, uh, Kaya already has a little pine cone collection going. Uh, so, uh, so in addition to that. Uh, but um, also in terms of uh, newness being uh, the word for my story, um, was the, the, the newness of the spring supermoon rising and uh, r reminding us, uh, despite all our confusion, yet again, we, we are blessed with the coming of another spring. Mm -hmm. My name is Keith Walsh. I live in Thetford Center, Vermont. Uh, I am, <laughs> I play as a farmer. I really don't do that for a living, and I haven't done it for very long. I'm a flatlander, and I'm true to it. So in just in case you can't tell by the way I talk, you know. Uh, but I have spent uh, well over 20 years, <coughs> excuse me, uh, tending bar uh, in Harvard Square in Boston in Cambridge, Mass. I've done it in uh, the French Quarter in New Orleans. I've done it in Burlington. I've done it in White River Junction. I've done it in Rhode Island. And I can't. I don't know if I can overstate in any way the, uh, the depth of connection that happens through story and communication. And it's not always fueled by alcohol, although it certainly can help in some instances. The, the truth uh, of the differences between us and how we can understand that uh, is, uh, is defined and uh, clarified through our communication. I've seen deans of colleges for Harvard sitting next to people who would be considered the lowest rungs in our society. Uh, being able to find commonality and connection through the depth of their experiences and being able to communicate that to one another. Uh, so as we all have our own individual experiences with uh, the soil and our earth, as we all have our own individual experiences trying to regenerate our soil that we have abused for so long as people on this planet, 
uh, keep in mind that how we share that story um, works as our mycelial network in helping to share uh, the riches of uh, in depth that we have in our experiences and, and the impact that you will have on others um, may not seem like much at the time, but, but you're, you're, you're planting seeds and providing nutrients and minerals in every single time you communicate verbally or not. So uh, thank you all for sharing here today and for uh, keeping this communication happening. Hi. Um, am I holding this at the right place? My name is Kai Cochran, and uh, I grew up on Cape Cod, but I spent many years in Montana, um, working at first for a, a group of farmers and ranchers who were trying to fight the uh, coming uh, coal strip mining uh, in Montana in the 70s and, and also into the 80s. Uh, and as I worked for them, I, I found that I instinctively wanted to promote something and not fight it. I, I don't like fighting things. I rather promote things. And so I worked into actually forming another organization that was uh, promoting the use of renewable energy, the Alternative Energy Resources Organization in Montana, which is still going strong, and so is the original one, the Northern Plains Resource Council. Uh, I moved back to Vermont uh, to a farm that my grandparents had bought in 1940. They lived in Boston, so they were absentee landowners. Uh, but my mother inherited the farm and she wanted at least one of her five kids to come back and live there because she lived on the Cape and she couldn't just keep on paying all the taxes on the farm without having at least one of her kids living there. So. Uh, my husband and I and our, our three-year-old twins moved back to this small farm in West Hartford, Vermont. Um, and I am, I'm very, and then of course, you know, a number of years later I found myself embroiled in another incredibly huge thing happening, which is climate change. And, and I, I, I could think of a million ways to try to fight that, but uh, as soon as I started hearing about the soil and the, and the life in the soil and how that might actually be a hopeful thing that we could promote, that was what I really wanted. And I love Bale anyway, and Cat is one of my best friends. <laughs> and so, uh, unfortunately, uh, my kids all have moved back to Vermont too, and my younger son, is farming, our farm again. And he is very, very interested in uh, doing all of the soil principles that uh, are talked about and, and, and experimenting with Johnson Sioux uh, composters and, and that sort of thing. So, so I feel very, very delighted that that sort of thing is happening and I love having this kind of thing happen. <coughs> My name is Cynthia Jackson, and I live in Randolph. <clears throat> I've been here for 50 years, which is a drop in the bucket. <laughs> and uh, I've lived in the house I am now for 40 years, and spent the first mm, 38 expanding gardens and things like that. And then all of a sudden, it sort of got ahead of me. <laughs> And at 86, it really is ahead of me. <laughs> and I have a backyard that I would love somebody to take over at any time. <laughs> I'm still gonna wrestle with my gardens in front. But <laughs> um, I love gardening and um, I'm just enjoying this and feeling as though I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Cynthia, also Cynthia Queech. I live here in Randolph. Um, uh, probably knew that was involved with uh, the Exit 4 group. I think a couple other members are here. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with uh, the offshoot of that, which is going to be uh, 
Randolph Community Orchard, where we actually have done something similar to that. I think her name is Genevieve, I'm not sure if she's still here, uh, was talking about um, having a, a public resource where, uh, in this case, it's an orchard that we'll be trying to put up along the kind of regenerative agriculture lines. Well, you know, slowly, it's just starting out, nothing's happened yet, but that's the path that we are going down. And uh, just personally, also interested in any kind of regenerative soil um, topics. And that's not me. So thanks. Hi, um, my name is Tammy Jo. Um, or Joe, as all my grandchildren call me, um, because I'm all about the kids, and that's what I do. I teach the kids as much as I can, as much as I know, and I encourage them to learn more. But they're all all under the age of um, seven right now, but they're all up and coming, and you know they have a lot, um, a lot of curiosity. And um, when I take care of my grandchildren, I bring them outside. And it's the main thing that I do. I take them in the woods, I take them everywhere where they can learn about the earth and, and whatever. So that's, that's my function right now. So <laughs> the more I learn, the more I can help them learn. That's the way I look at it. So, and I'm a Vermonter, mostly. I've moved away a few times, but I keep coming back and I think I'm gonna stay. So. Um, I'm Lauren. Um, I've been here, there, and everywhere, and I think this past year has been a really big year for me in terms of getting angry at the world and trying to reconcile that with doing something about it. Um, and so I like coming to these events because people here want to solve issues and overthrow the way we all think, and I think um, hearing today how storytelling can contribute to that is really um, informative, to say the least. My name is Kep. I um, lived in Vermont for about 30 years and raised my kids here. And my eldest son, Ross, um, fell in love with a Kiwi woman and moved to New Zealand. And the first time I went to visit them, I was absolutely certain that I was going to fall in love with New Zealand and never want to come back to Vermont, but I didn't. I, I can't imagine living anywhere else, and I think part of that is represented here tonight. I, I just love the way we respect one another, even though we come from different backgrounds and whatnot, and I, I just really appreciate this kind of a forum. And so thank you presenters for making this happen. And I also want to say I can't wait for the geeky part about <laughs> soil science. Next week. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> My name is Chris White. Um, I guess I'm here. I walked into the bail office completely unannounced. And Chris and Abby were very receptive. Um, I am endeavoring to start a farm. Um, I previously worked in digital storytelling, so both soil and storytelling are very applicable to like my, the, my current situation. Um, but yeah, I couldn't have been more pleased to meet all of you. And, um, that's it. Let's just ask a question. <clears throat> what are you thinking, yeah? Um, no, this is so inspiring to be here and talk with all of you, and I really appreciate um, you having me come uh, share my thoughts, Kat. Um, I do want to just give a little uh, invitation to all of you to, um, there's a flyer over on the table, and um, as part of the Healthy Soils Law Project, I'm uh, working to develop um, a community engagement uh, piece, uh, because I, I really deeply am interested in learning um, all of the stories that uh, inform the way um, that we live and interact with one another. Um, and as a lawyer, I'm interested, I'm interested in learning how that can, um, how those can come together to help us um, identify really uh, strong feedback loops and policies um, that will allow us to work together to uh, steward our environment and support one another. 
Um, so if anybody's interested, you know, uh, I'm uh, not quite ready to do interviews yet, but we'll be starting in May. Um, and I'm interested in, in uh, hearing from anybody who has anything to say about uh, the ways that governments can work with um, farmers and land managers to support the ways in which people are stewarding the environment and increase you know, our overall um, collective stewardship. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't have any um, questions, but I, well, I guess I did have one. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, uh, I'm no expert in storytelling, and I don't, I don't know any experts in storytelling. Um, I don't know that there are any. Um, we are constantly telling stories. Um, kids tell stories, you know, with no experience whatsoever. Stories are the way that we interact with each other. Um, so nobody's bad at telling stories. Um, you know, sure, maybe somebody um, doesn't captivate our attention the same way somebody else's story might, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that person is less of a storyteller. Um, a lot of us, may feel we have stories to share, but don't know how to share them. Um, and, you know, that's form, that's not content. I think it's really important to remember um, that, you know, stories are, are communication um, and, you know, there are ways for us to connect and nobody should be afraid to tell their story. Um, I, think, I think it's a, a really important uh, may, it may seem small, but I think it's a really important point to make. Um, you know, in the in my my past experience um, as a defense as a public defender, um, I I was constantly um, you know working to to convince not only people to listen, but to convince other people that their stories were worth sharing. Um, and it's, it's an amazing thing uh, to see somebody stand beside you and, and, and feel that their story is important, um, to, to hear them share it, and then to see what happens when people are moved by it. It's a powerful thing and it should not be, um, you know, it shouldn't be diminished. Um, facts are devoid of um, perspective, but they also um, just, they, they cannot, they cannot tell the full story. It's impossible because um, the way that we experience things, um, that's the story. And the, way, the meaning that we derive um, individually and together is the story. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced, um, you know, if you share something that happened to you or that you experience just um, day to day, and uh, you're surprised by the reaction that you get. You know, somebody, somebody may, may say, oh my gosh, that's amazing, I can't believe um, that happened to you, that's horrifying, that's terrible, you know, and, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't think it was so bad. <laughs> um, that, that, that is perspective, you know? Um, gosh, maybe I should be mad. Um, you know, that, that, is particip that is participation um, and that is where the storytelling comes alive and allows us to really, you know, connect with one another. Um, it allows our own perspectives to evolve. Um, and it allows us to see uh, our story within one another. And I, I, I love what um, somebody said about uh, getting to know the soil. You know, I come from Philadelphia where much like East ba any part of Baltimore, um, you can go blocks without seeing, seeing any uh, kind of life. It's, it's almost as though our cities have become dead zones. Um, and kids, are, kids grow up not knowing soil and not knowing um, that food comes from somewhere other than the grocery store and not being able to recognize you know, good, healthy food um, versus something ma manufactured. And, uh, if there is soil, it's most likely uh, toxic. And that is the soil that some kids uh, play in, and that is their experience of dirt. 
Um, and that's a great tragedy. I think that we can really uh, use storytelling and also, um, you know, just recognizing that coming, that um, getting to know something allows us to really love it um, and protect it and care for it. It's true for people and it is just as true for our environment. So yeah, thanks for having me on the sub. <laughs> Um, I don't have that much more to say, but I do want to tell everyone, in case you're, you don't know, <clears throat> I just dug in, so there's some bread pudding on the table over there. Um, it's awesome. Hey, did it come from Black Friday? Yeah, yeah so, so, yeah, it was, I was going to say, yeah. uh, when we closed, um, for everybody who wants hot, just made um, bread pudding, and then some... She said some maple cream kind of topping. That's so sweet. They, they feel badly. So, yes. so, so they made hot bread pudding. So anyway, so on, your way, on your way out, you know, for those who don't have to dash, there's some yummy dessert. And um, I don't know if you all have noticed, but I am growing another human, so the baby was hungry. Um, I'm like, I'm just really uh, reveling in this, and I'm, I kind of feel like I've switched over to listening mode, so like, I don't have that much more to share, but I'm so thankful. Like, this is obviously a huge part of my current story, um, and I'm so happy that like this little person is getting to like to hear from all of you <laughs> as it grows, because they, they can hear in there. It's very cool. Um, so I'm really thankful that like this is kind of part of uh, this new story. And also, I've been thinking how excited I am to get into the soil. And also, did you know that they tell pregnant ladies not to yes. like, play in soil? Yes. Can I ignore? I'm going to ignore that advice, I think, because I'm not going to be able to not get my hands in the dirt. <clears throat> um, and I also am very excited because this baby is due in the middle of May, which is asparagus season. And we have this like beautiful 10-foot bed of asparagus in my house that just like I, we pick like a pound a day um, in the middle of May. So I feel like. I'm just so excited for spring and soil and all that is happening. And asparagus, oh my God, fresh asparagus. Um, and oh, and also just in terms of um, connecting, this feels very formal, but um, I do have a bunch of business cards and I'm gonna just like leave some on the table in case anybody wants to um, get in touch with me or with NOFA. Um, I would love to hear from any of you. So thanks so much for being here again and thank you again to Cass who whose fan club I'm also um, yes. proud of yes. um, Thank you all so much. This has been really fun. I didn't quite know what to expect. Um, and I've learned a lot through this whole process about story. Um, so I, I wear a, f a lot of hats and a couple are, are relevant here. I guess they're all relevant, but um, one of my hats is I, I manage the edible schoolyard at Thetford Elementary School, and um, we, we compost 200 pounds of food scraps a week. The sixth graders run the compost system. And um, I've been doing that for 10 years with the school, and I help design the gardens and the compost. And it's amazing the, the stories that these kids I, I learn so much from them every time I work with them, but I feel very proud that these kids for the last 10 years have experienced an edible schoolyard. And their lessons built around this outdoor classroom that they can eat from and they can smell and they can listen to the wind and, and all of their food scraps are going into compost that then turn into soil and go back to their gardens. We call it the food loop. Um, and when I, when I heard from some of you coming around the circle, and, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to live where I live and to have the opportunities that I have. And I'm grateful that these children that I get to work with are, are going out into the world with this very rich story of connection to the planet that feeds us all. Um, I can't wait to geek out next week. <laughs> if any of you have ever heard me talk about soil, that's really what it's all about for me, is I love to talk about science and soil and systems. Um, I'm going to do the intro next week, and then my colleagues are really going to geek out. So Juan and Jess are really going to get to get into it. So if you're into the science piece, um, definitely come next week. This was a really nice break 
from slideshows. Um, I love I love my own slideshows too, but I just it's I love to look at you all and know that you're my neighbors and that we live in this community get together. And as we move forward, um, we can and will do what needs to be done to adapt and transform to meet this climate emergency. We have to. We have the skills. I want to hear your stories. We can do this together. I, I just know that we can, and we, we've got to bring more people in. Um, so I said at the beginning, uh, Chris and I have decided now that May 8th, or 9th, it's a Wednesday that week. It'll be here. Well, actually, we, we have to ask. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if we get permission. After we get permission. Yeah, so this last event, uh, which we hope will be here, um, is going to be a three hour long event, no speakers. So that's when we're going to take a lot of the information that we've been pulling in uh, for the last events and the next three. And Lauren has been taking great notes, and she and I are working together to keep those really organized. So I think we're going to really have um, some productive session. And the goal there is to plug people in. So this is about acting. Right now we're talking, we're getting to know each other, and that's important so that we can continue to trust each other as we, as we fix, yeah. we fix it all. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I wasn't gonna say that. <laughs> um, so I, Chris, do you have any last? Um, thank you all so much. I'm so impressed it's nine o'clock or half an hour over time. You must be enjoying yourselves. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, eat, go eat, go eat.